because I'm sure we have a lot to cover. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to, actually this is session two, it says session one, but it's actually session two of our sprint. So I'd like to welcome everybody. I am Shelly Maves and I'm here on behalf of the Illinois FAST Center at um, University of Illinois Research Park. And I'd like to welcome all of you back. Um, I did wanna make a note for those of you that are auditing the session, there is help available. If you would also like one-on-one -on -one assistance, you can um, contact the FAST Center and uh, we can put the link in the chat to register. So you can also receive one-on-one -on -one assistance if you would like. Um, for everybody else, I've heard that the feedback has been great. So um, I will turn it over to Roland for to begin our session too. Thank you. All right, everybody, welcome to session two. We have a lot uh, as to cover, as Shelly said. Today we're going to talk about, let's see, get my presentation working here. There we go. Um, budget and justification. Uh, and then as part of that, I will talk a little bit about personnel because personnel can take a lot of different forms, subs, contractors, consultants. Uh, one of the critical parts that gets kind of underplayed in the guidelines, but is very important to the application is letter of support. And Chris is going to talk about that. And we're going to talk a little bit about team and company readiness in general. There is an assignment or there will be soon, as soon as I'm done here, about team company readiness. And Chris will go over some of, some of what we're looking for there. And if there's time, Chris has some information about the structure of the program. So we'll see if we can get that in. But if so, then, then she can talk a little bit about that. From the assignments, uh, first of all, we'll review the assignments. We're getting a lot of good information of the assignments. People are getting a lot out of them and we're able to tell what you're thinking and where you're going and we're able to give very good feedback as a result of your assignments. Please feel free to question the assignments. Uh, when I had last week's assignments, I quickly got a couple questions and made a couple adjustments to kind of refine it. This is a first time effort. We've not offered a sprint before, as I've mentioned. So, you know, we're looking for your feedback on the program, your feedback on the assignments, because we want to keep making it better and we want to keep offering the program. All right, when, when talking about the outlines, the one of the big things that I noticed was everybody got pretty much the idea of you make your case statement first and then you flow into the structure that's required by the proposal. But the part that wasn't so clear was you have to read the guidelines and understand what's really being requested in those sections of the proposal. What I got was a lot of points just being put over into the sections of the proposal that sort of made sense if you just looked at the header, but weren't exactly what they're calling for in the guidelines. So you need to look at the guidelines and read them and understand exactly what's what they're really wanting there. And you have to look through the guidelines. This is back on page 92. So it's a while before you get to the meat of the, of the document, but make sure you understand what is actually being looked for. Um, facilities and equipment. The important part here is to, to describe the facilities and equipment that you will need to conduct the work. So as you look through your work, you know it'll require some kind of devices, some testing devices, maybe a lab to do assays, make sure that those are listed. That's what's gonna be asked for in the facilities in and equipment. Aha, very few people got this one. The significant section of the proposal is where you put in your sentence or two about the statement of commercial potential. You've got a few lines, you only have six pages, so you don't have a lot of room, but in the significant section is where you say, here's where we think the sales will occur, here's who, who's gonna buy. You have to kind of compact that into a couple of sentences, but to show that you've thought about the market, that goes into the significance section of the research strategy. Also in general, uh, the specific aims were sort of where I expected them to be now, but they will need to be a little bit more precise and a little bit more focused. Uh, we're getting a lot of academic goals, which is not surprising because most people here came from academic institutions. And the academic goals are you know, to characterize, to formularize, to observe, to study. That's basic research. But SBIR is beyond basic research. It's applied research. And phase one is a feasibility study. So your specific aims have to answer the question, what's, what are the key points of the technology that really have to be proven? And how will we know if they work or not? So they need to be specific. They need to talk about measurable statistics, how you're going to prove that you meet everything. 
Also, just as a tip, it wasn't part of the assignment, but um, in the approach section where you go through your research plan, you discuss your research study and how you're going to break out test groups and, and everything, it's a good idea to think in terms of risks and mitigation. So when you get to the next uh, iteration of your thinking, include in that approach, if plan A, what's plan A? If plan A fails, what's plan B? If plan B fails, what's plan C? So think in terms of risks and mitigation for the next time around. All right, Chris, you had a couple things to add here. I did. Um, I'm gonna go in the same order that you went. Um, first of all, from the facilities and equipment perspective, always lead with the company. Um, I noticed that a lot of people started with the university facilities and equipment, but um, that company is the primary applicant. And um, I know nobody intended to do this, but it would be fraudulent to position uh, university resources as be belonging to the company. So that's a big thing that, um, you know, when you talk about resources that are the universities, you cannot put them um, under the framework of the company has access to them 24 hours a day. You do not. Um, also on that, um, oh, on the aims, uh, similar to what Roland said, I, when I read the, the uh, homework, I, I just kept saying, you know, the aims really need to have technical risk. Um, there needs to be something that's, that's risky. It can't just be um, general business operations or growth, like hiring staff or scaling up. It has to be technical. So think about what's that miss, missing technical thing. <clears throat> I generally use two groups of questions on phase one. And, and when you think about answering these questions, what do you need to do? So the first is to demonstrate feasibility is does it work and can you build it? So technically, can you connect A, B and get C? And then uh, do they like it and will they use it? So from the end user perspective, um, is it something that they're giving thumbs up to and they said, yeah, this, this meets our needs or, or not. Um, on the um, company info, let's see. Um, oh, commercialization information, you know, um, I'll talk about that a little bit more. I'll save that till the, to the last section, Roland, because that sort of addresses what we're talking Sounds about good. For, yeah. for next week. Um, on the approach, um, uh, for, I'm going to show a slide in just a second, but in addition to risk and mitigations, I like to end every aim discussion in, in every aim with a milestone. So the reviewer can see your project progress um, from start to finish, and they know that you're measuring your success along the way. Now, I want to share a, a, an additional document that Roland's going to pull up to sort of talk about the approach, the way I like to think about the approach. Um, and it's a Word document, sorry. I couldn't make it fit landscape on a slide. And you know my technical skills, Roland. Right, okay. Can everybody see this? Okay. So really when you think about approach, I like to start that section with an overall discussion of the overall goal. And I'm talking about sentences here, folks, not paragraphs, but sentences. Overall goal of the entire project. So in this instance, I'm saying improve outcomes and reduce costs for patients with COPD. So that's like the globe, right? Then you kind of hone in to North America and you talk about your overall goal for this SBIR STTR. And that might be um, develop and commercialize platform technology for patient management. Okay, so that's your overall SBIR goal. But then you got to go in even closer and tell reviewers what your phase one goal is. And that's to demonstrate feasibility of the integrated sensors and RFID. I made all this up. I have no idea if it's even possible. So that's your phase one goal. And that's more like the United States. But then you got to go in even further when you talk about your aims. And that's like the state of Illinois. And then if you scroll down a little further, Roland, then we get to talk about the tasks. And that's like the level of a city. So just to show how we go from sort of that global perspective all the way down to that really specific task, that's what the uh, approach section should look like, that kind of discussion. Okay. All right, I'll just add one other thing regarding AIMS, and that's that uh, the SBIR program, all of the agencies are looking for a certain level of risk. So it's not a good approach to say, well, we've got it pretty much all working. We just need to engineer a few final optimization portions and we're good to go. If you're that far along, then you're not risky enough for the yeah. SBIR program. Yeah. So you want to show that there's some unknowns, there's some uncertainty. Don't present this as something that's uh, uh, already concluded. 
All right, uh, before we move on, any questions on this, this portion? Let's just pause for a minute here, see if any arise. Hi, this is Jason Chen. Can I ask a quick question? All about right. the facility, I know Chris mentioned about it. So for most of us, I believe we used our family address to register uh, the companies. So if we cannot use university resource, right. Oh, well, how are we going to do that? It's also impossible for us to do Well, that. I knew that was going to, I could have pr predicted that question. Um, so you talk about company facilities uh, one of two ways. First of all, it's expected that the company has a location where they conduct business, that they have access to 24 hours a day. So um, no one else can preclude you from gaining access to that and there needs to be some level of security. So um, now you don't have to be super specific and give the address. Sometimes we describe a home office as, you know, uh, Nuco's located in a 200 square foot office with a locking door and file cabinets, and you have three workstations and a printer. You know, you, you just need to describe the physical space so people know where this is happening, even if it's not um, an actual you know, physical locate like a building, like an office building. The second option is that when you look at, um, if you're going to get a phase, you can certainly talk about space in the sense of if you're awarded a phase one, you will lease space at uh, either a university affiliated incubator or another community type incubator. And you can describe that space and even the resources that come with that space. I do that a lot. A lot of my um, clients are hooked with community or with uh, university incubators. And in the facilities section, there are five different criteria that we list. And under other, we talk about the services that are provided to clients of those incubators because reviewers really view those positively. Um, I always talk about like the, the hands, that little hands. Um, you see it in all kinds of webinars where there's like a plant coming up and somebody's holding their hands like this full of dirt. That's an incubator. And that's what we want to tell reviewers is that your little tiny company, your little seedling company um, is, is held up by and surrounded by supports of, of a incubator. That was a ramble, sorry. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yes, but I don't know how to describe it. I mean, but in the grant applications, because I mean, what's the kind of language would it be? Exactly? I can share, I can share some language. <laughs> Templates for us would be great. I'll email you some some kind of generic language. Yeah, that's pretty perfect. Thank you so much. Uh huh. Yeah. And another point that came up, Jonathan mentioned this. It's a good thing to mention. If you have a subcontract with the university, then you want to list their resources. Yep. If you've got a a contract with some kind of a vendor who does assays or something, you want to mention their resources. So anything that's part of the proposal whether it's a you know, rent or a subcontract or some kind of arrangement like that, you can go ahead and mention them as well. Absolutely, you just can't, you just can't represent the university facilities as your own. Even, even core, if you're using core facilities and, and doing you know, fee-for-service work there, you can certainly talk about that, you should. Um, but you know, it's important to draw, you, you just draw a distinction. You list yours, then you list the subcontractors. Yeah, Chris, I think so for the phase two, it would be easier. But for us, I mean, at least for me, it started with phase one. So that's, we don't have anything for. Like, Nobody does. It's okay. okay. It's an easy problem to overcome. I'll send you some sample language that will help you see what I'm talking about. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Let's move ahead to the next assignment. All right. The abstracts. Uh, uh, when you looked for abstracts, I hope this was a useful assignment. It looked like it was based on the information that you got. Um, one thing that I might add is note the level of technical detail in the abstracts. They tend to be a little bit more general and not too heavily oriented towards all the details and all the jargon. So you want to keep that kind of approach. Don't put too much jargon and detail into the abstract. Keep it a little bit more general. Uh, the people who reviewed it still, I think, could have uh, applied what they learned a little bit more to their own abstract. and. But AdGraph did this really well. They looked through the proposals and they discovered that uh, they had too many specific aims. And they discovered that a lot of people had, uh, you know, mentioned or in the abstracts had mentioned other grants. And so they were going to adjust according to that. 
So that's, that's a good example of what you can learn and what you can pull out from the abstracts. Chris. Okay, um, I just wanted to point out on the abstract, um, you know, Roland and I have been doing this for a long time and we each have our sort of own, um, I have a very specific format I like to see the abstract in, which is essentially uh, a mini AIMS document. Um, and I like to see um, that, that just kind of like shrunken down to those 30 lines and you include, I like to see enumerated aims in there so that uh, somebody can quickly see what your aims are. But remember, there's no proprietary information in that abstract. That's really it. All right. Let's see, some questions came in. Chris, would you send us all sentences describing facilities? And thank you, Ming asked for the text. Oh, yes. See, I meant to send that to everybody. I sent it to Laura only, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send it to everybody now. Um, I will prepare it and put it in Canvas. Okay. That. We'll plan on uploading it then. All right, moving along. Everyone. Uh, the draft email to uh, the program officer. You know, a tip that we didn't include in the assignment, but I thought of afterwards as I was looking through all these emails, it's, it's really nice if you can kind of reflect the priorities of the Institute and the center. There's a topic list where you can look at their priorities and you can look at their website. And if your email says, we are addressing the center's priority of such and such by such and such, then you're showing how you are meeting their goals and not how they're just gonna help you meet your goals. And I might mention it's, it's a little bit handier if you can include a specific action item for your response. You can say, yes, we're looking to meet you. Uh, but then if you at the end say, you know, here are times that are available or what you'd like to do, and Realm Han had a very good example of that. They actually listed specific times that they were available so that the program officer could come back and more easily schedule something. Chris, your points. Yeah, my points are um, similar to how we talked about with the facilities. Um, you need to lead with your role with the company. And so some of you juggle both, right? Your faculty and you're a co-founder of the company. But when you send this email to the PO, you're approaching them as the company co-founder. And so lead with that role. And that's really like a small thing. And it's not going to make or break the, the communication with the program officer, but it's designed to get you in the frame of mind that you're a company and not a university lab seeking uh, input from the PO. So lead with that in your, your intro. Um, the other thing is I saw, um, you know, when you attach that, that abstract to the PO, make sure that you include your specific aims. The most important thing that we wanna get feedback on from them is what you are proposing to do, not the, the, the need, they're familiar with the need, not the market, you know, but what are you going to do in phase one? Because that's where they can provide the most insight. Um, an example might be that uh, I had a client one time who was developing a, a new way to do a formulation for pediatric um, uh, dosing. And he was using like chronic ear infections as the, the um, disease state that they were gonna study this on. And the PO came back and said, eh, we're not really interested in ear infections because studies now show that, you know, if you don't take antibiotics, they'll go away on their own, but use sinusitis. And, that was like super helpful information, very basic, but had he not included his aims, he wouldn't have gotten that. Um, also be, be wary of when you get responses back from POs. I saw this in somebody who had already contacted the PO. Be wary of cut and paste information they might include in their email. Um, this particular response from the PO mentioned a fast track and a direct to phase two options. I have very strong opinions on both of those things. It's another one of those like nerdy SBIR things I love to opine on. Um, but don't, don't take that as them saying, you need to apply for that. They might just be telling you those things exist. Um, and then the last point is sort of the roles within the, uh, the, within NIH, but we'll talk about that in that. That's what that whole last section is designed to cover. So that's it. All right. Let's move ahead to budget then. And I will uh, go through these points fairly quickly. What I'm gonna talk about is mostly where people have the greatest questions regarding budget. It's not comprehensive, it doesn't cover everything, but I'm gonna talk about the areas where I get the most questions and the most, uh, most concern and see the most problems. But before I do that, 
overall, there are two main concepts that are important as overall guiding concepts for the budget. One is realism is important. What really the reviewers look for is a budget that matches the work in hand. So you don't want to try and trim your budget and make it look better than it really is. You don't want to inflate your budget and make it look really worse than it is. These people are very skilled in their field. They will know what's appropriate uh, and they will assess for realism. So try and make your budget as realistic as you can. Also, don't lose money. Make sure that if you have inspections that you include them. Also, if your budget is actually smaller than the amount of work to be performed and you are going to add some of your own money or investor money to complete the whole project, you can say that. But say that in terms of explaining why the budget is realistic. Matching costs are not required. You do not get any points for matching costs. You do not get any uh, ratings on the evaluation criteria for any matching funds. Certainly not a requirement. But if you need matching funds in order to make sure that the project is realistic, it's worth mentioning that. I'll talk first about indirect costs because I get the most questions on indirect costs. You have direct costs. Direct costs are any costs that are directly attributable to this project. These would include labor, associated travel, materials and supplies. If they're work directly on the project, that's a direct cost. In addition to direct costs, you have indirect costs. Running the company, communications costs, uh, labor to, if you have a secretary or an assistant, you know, labor for th those kinds of roles, rent, utilities. These are all indirect costs. And the SBIR agencies all recognize that for all the direct costs you have, you actually incur these indirect costs as well. And they want to compensate you for the indirect costs as well as the direct costs. This is part of the don't lose money concept. If you have a direct cost, you need to recoup your indirect costs as well. The agencies realize that and they let you charge indirect costs. Now, for these SBIR proposals, for most of my clients, for most of Chris Plot, Chris's clients, there are three general categories of indirect costs. You can have a lot of different categories. You can have more of these. You might see references to more of these, especially with the Department of Defense. But in general, your indirect costs will fall into one of these three categories. Fringe benefits are indirect costs that apply directly to salary only. Payroll taxes, health insurance, retirement benefits. Uh, time off is a fringe benefit. These are all fringe benefits. They apply to salary and wages only. General and administrative expenses apply to running the company in general. They're not specific to personnel, but they are for the whole company. Rent will be an example of that, phone utilities. Now, in addition to that, the SBR program allows you to make a profit. They say that you can just tack on a fee or a profit on top of everything else. And uh, that's a third indirect cost. So you've got these three levels of indirect costs. Now, you have to get all of these indirect costs into the total budget guideline, the $256,580 that you can apply for a standard NIH phase one proposal has to include your direct plus your indirect plus your fee and profit. All right, let's look at a, uh, an example here of a single tier cost element. This is what you usually see with the National Science Foundation. You have staff costs of, let's see if I can get my highlighter working here. We will use a highlighter. Let's say you have staff costs of about $150,000. There we go. Uh, fringe benefits in a single tier element are included in a single indirect cost rate. So you don't separate out fringe benefits. But you have some other direct costs, travel and materials and supplies and such, and that comes to $164,000 in this example. Then for uh, NSF, you can take the uh, a single indirect rate of 50%, apply it to labor only, and that comes to $74,751. You have total direct and indirect, and on top of that, you have your fee, and then the total request comes to $256,000. Single tier cost element, very simple. One single indirect pool includes fringe benefits, it includes GNA. It gets applied to staff and labor only. 
and you uh, have to include it all in the total budget. Now notice here, you've got $256,000, but you know, 150,000 is staff costs. So by the time you have indirect and fee put in, your staff costs go down quite a bit. So you only have about uh, you know 50% of your total budget, 50 to 60% in staff costs. Now, if you look at the two tier element uh, approach, you, ha you have even less staff costs. You apply fringe benefits to staff costs only. You have your other direct costs, you total those, and that makes a total direct costs. Then you apply GNA to the total direct costs only. That gives you a number here. On that number, you apply your fee and you get your total budget request of $256,000. So that's how a single tier and a multi-tier cost element go. Uh, any questions on that before I move forward? Because sometimes I get questions on indirect cost rates. Hello. Leon. Hi, thanks. Uh, I don't know if this is the right place to ask this question. Um, our team is uh, involved with uh, Northwestern University, and uh -huh. I, I think it, we, qualify, we probably are considered like a research partner with them. Um, I, I've read that uh, with the SCTR program, the uh, small business has to perform 40% um, of the work and the um, research institution has to perform 30%. Um, I was wondering if you could offer any clarification on um, how to account for that. Uh, it's, does that mean that we then need to pay uh, certain employees through the university and then reimburse the university through the grant? How do we sort of meet that 30% um, threshold? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's an excellent question. In that case, the university is a subcontractor with an STTR. And I might add for the group, the 40% and the 30% are minimum minima that you have to do at least that the small business has to do at least 40 percent the institution has to do at least 30 percent structurally the institution is a subcontractor in that situation and the subcontractor and consultant expenses you add up together and that's the part that has to be at least 30 percent subcontractor and consultant are included in the 30 percent the 40% is everything else. It's the company employees, it's the vendors that you pay for, the travel, the other direct costs, the general administrative expenses and the fee, they all count towards the 40%. And I was just gonna add, um, as far as how you allocate that, that across the proposal, um, we look at that um, effort is measured in time and money. And so it's not, your budget is important. It's critical, impo critically important. But in addition, in your actual approach, when you're describing the work that you're going to accomplish, a reviewer needs to be able to find those roles, that split in the description of tasks. So they need to be reading your research plan and say, oh, okay, this is gonna happen at Northwestern. This is gonna happen at Northwestern. Oh, the company's doing this. Oh, okay. And at the end say, oh yeah, I see. I see what the company's doing. I see what Northwestern's doing. And yes, it equates that about 40%. So it's not just money. It also has to be your time, your effort. So, so we, can, we can allocate a percentage of time, even though if there's not an actual explicit transfer of, of dollars? Uh, well, they go together. So a university isn't going to let you allocate you know, their staff or a, a faculty member without dollars attached to it. I see. Um, I see. So... <laughs> Okay, thank you. That's that's very very helpful. Yeah, can I just uh, this is Ming. Can I just follow up quickly on Leon's question? So, so we're we're partner with the uh, University of Chicago. Actually, we're thinking about the uh, putting sixty percent subcontract with University of Chicago and then the remaining forty percent at our company. That's that 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 is fine, right? Yeah, that's allowable. Okay, good. Thank you yeah. very much. Hey, uh, Ronan, this is Wei Bin, um, um, also Hi. partnering with uh, Northwestern. Uh, I just want to point out from what I uh, learned from the discussion with our uh, grant uh, admin at the Northwestern, because the Northwestern, for example, any contract with external, they will have to charge indirect. For example, you can do 50% with Northwestern, maybe 100,000, for example, or 40%, 100,000 K allocated to Northwestern. However, 
the Northwestern will have to take 68% uh, of the indirect, uh, of the direct to indirect. For example, you give 100K to Northwestern, maybe only 60,000K can come to your lab to do the research. So the 60,000K direct cost the lab add 68 percent of indirect tech coming to northwestern but northwestern have to take off the like a indirect from your total 100k so that's what i'm trying to maybe help right yeah that's a, that's a really good point and i'll mention it later i'll go ahead and mention it now although it comes up in a slide later on the university budget in an sttr or an sbir where you subcontract them um has to be broken out with the same level of detail as the main budget. They will submit their own budgets as well as your budget. And so the university will have its indirect rates. It will have a fringe benefit rate. It will have a GNA rate. It won't have a profit, but uh, the university rate to the proposal will include the university's indirect costs. So you have multiple levels of indirect costs. The university, let's say you've got a student at the university who's a grad student working on your project. That student will get some fringe benefits applied at the university level. That student will get GNA applied at the university level. That will roll into a, a, a total dollar number of the subcontract. And then the company itself, when it submits the proposal, will apply some indirect rates to that subcontract as well. So you have multiple levels of indirect rates. So the company indirect is you define it or the NIH defines? Well, a very good question. Uh, what rate do you use in the proposal? Excellent question. It's the next slide here. How do you determine what rates to use? Well, if you're, you're, you're in a university, you've already got a negotiated indirect cost rate agreement with some institution and the the other agencies will generally honor if you've got a, an agreement with one institution. Most startup companies haven't had a negotiated rate yet. And so what they can do is they can fall back on safe rates that are allowed by the agencies. And the different agencies have different safe rates. NIH has an advertised safe rate of 40% for FNA. Now, a little bit of a, of a divergence here According to the Federal Access Regulation definition of modified total direct cost, MTDC, you're supposed to apply indirect costs to only the first $25,000 of a subcontract. However, a lot of agencies in NIH kind of overlook that and they let you apply the first $25,000 or they allow you to, to apply indirect to the entire amount of the subcontract. And so when you are setting your budget, you have to check with the agency and determine whether it's allowable to charge indirect on the total subcontract budget amount or whether you're limited to 25K. And Chris and I have had different experience on this. I've had proposals being submitted for the total 25 or for the total amount and the NIH agency says, no, you can't do that. You're limited to the first 25K. She's had proposals that she's worked on where they've uh, submitted the full amount and it's no pushback. They've gone with it without question. So you, you have to check with the agency. It really uh, changes. And even within the institute and the center, the program officer might be uh, have some say in this. And the time, you know, agencies can decide one program or one policy one year and another policy the next year. So you have to check. The NSF safe rate is 50%. That's the single tier. That's the total uh, fringe and GNA in one pool applied to staff and labor only. That's the NSF accepted safe rate, or they will let you put 10% of your total project costs as a safe rate. They have kind of two structures for a safe rate. All right, a third option here is that you can be prepared to negotiate a, an award. Let's say you've been operating for a couple of years and you know because you've kept really good books that your indirect rates are a little higher than the safe rates and you want to justify something more than the safe rate. Well, you can do that. As long as you're prepared to negotiate a safe rate, you can, in your proposal, say, we are uh, requesting a, a rate that's higher than the safe rate and we will pre be prepared for it. We'll be prepared to justify it. 
you don't have to justify it in the proposal, but if you get selected for an award and then you get an administrative review, during the administrative review, you will be required to support your indirect cost rate at that point. I'll just say while you're getting back to that, um, you know, NSF or NIH gives you that 40% with the expectation that you're, you have calculated at least on the back of a napkin, your overhead rate, and it is at least or greater than 40%. Um, if you're not going to get audited during a phase one, unless like, I mean, I shouldn't say never to anything, but odds are you won't get audited during a phase one. But if they should happen to come to you and ask for evidence of your 40% overhead rate, be prepared to, to show it. Um, and you can just like Google overhead rate on and get like a simple formula off the internet on how to calculate that and just make sure you're at least at or above that 40% rate. All right, Jonathan, you ask a question. Can staff time be used to pay to offset salary of the applicant? And uh, can you unmute and, and ask that? I'm not sure exactly what you're wondering here. It sounds like you might have something specific in mind. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> the question is related to, you know, if you're if you're paid, obviously paid by university, then we have, you know, a certain percentage of our time, at least in the clinical world, dedicated to clinical uh, time. And then we have sort of a percentage related to research time. Um, by With grants, we can kind of buy down our clinical time and, uh, you know, make it research time. And so can this sort of a proposal be used in that same way? Meaning like, can we pay back the university, you know, to sort of buy down our, our salary, so to speak? Yeah, that that would be a university specific question because it's up to university policy. And we should we should probably talk about this offline because there are a lot of uh, contingencies here. Uh, it would depend, you know, your stake in the co company makes a difference. If you're an equity holder, if you're a co-founder, then the rules might be a little bit different than if you're just being hired as a, a faculty member and you don't really have a stake in the company. So there are a lot of considerations to keep in mind. Make sure and talk to us about this. Thanks. All right. Uh, the fee that you include, that's pure profit. 7% uh, is what the standard is. Uh, phase one and phase two for NIH. NSF just moved up to 10% in phase two. There are no NSF applicants here for this round, but some of you might be applying to NSF. And in phase two, you can go up to 10%, but by and large, it's just 7%. And there aren't any points for keeping this low, except with the USDA. They actually say in their guidelines, if you uh, do less, you look a little bit better. If you do, they, they, they recommend that you have a low uh, profit rate, but you don't get any evaluation criteria, no points. So go ahead and claim the whole thing. Nothing to gain by, um, by being lower. Participant training support costs, this is simple, you skip it. It's not allowed in these proposals. The guidelines specifically say that. Uh, an example of a cost would be if you hire or if you pay people to come and take a survey, or if you pay people to come and be participants in some kind of a clinic, that would be a participant support cost. If you've got some kind of training and they come to take training, that would be participant support costs, but those aren't allowed. All right, personnel. Two kinds of personnel, senior personnel and other personnel. These are two separate lines on the budget form. The senior personnel have to be those who are making a substantive intellectual contribution to the project. These are the ones that you have to name in the proposal. They will submit a bio sketch. They will submit a current and pending support. They have an influence on the direction and research and development of the proposal. Anybody who's, um, who's on the staff and whose resume is really good and you wanna include them, you name them as senior personnel. Other personnel, it's okay to say they'll be determined. You can say we will hire a senior engineer to do some coding, and then you describe their role, you describe what they're doing, and you describe how you came up with their salary. So those are paid people who are on your staff, they're employees. Now, you can also play other kinds of people on your staff. You can pay subcontractors, you can pay consultants, you can pay people as vendors. A consultant is usually an individual who's making some kind of a contribution to the project, but is hired as an individual and you pay that individual directly, directly, not through any institution. A subcontract is what you get with a university in an STTR type situation, where it's an institution that's making a substantive contribution to the project. 
and you're paying them, you're paying everybody through the institution, not as individual. And a vendor is a company usually that provides a standard service with set salaries. A lab assay is a great idea, a great example of that. You send off the materials, they perform the lab, they send it back to you. And so they're not really influencing the direction of the project. They're not contributing in any kind of a substantive way. They're just providing a set service. Now, there's a gray area between a subcontract and a vendor. Sometimes you have a choice, really, whether you go with one or whether you go with the other. It's not a clear dividing line. And so it's a good idea to talk with us, one of us and think through what's included, uh, whether you in, in are consider somebody a subcontractor or whether you cons consider them a vendor. Now, related to the question of what's in your 30% and what co counts towards the university's 40%, well, consultants and subcontracts, as I mentioned, those are part of the outside work that uh, does not count towards the company's contribution. A vendor, however, is paid by the company and that's counted as part of the company's part of the 30% the, the that you have to do in an STTR. I just wanna add that even though the vendor's not subject to that cap, um, like we talked about earlier, because that those percentages are measured in time and money, if you send the majority of your money out the door to a vendor and they're doing the majority of the work, you will get raked over the coals by reviewers. So um, that's not a solution. If you are going to outsource all of the work, then that is the company that should apply for the SBIR, not your company. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. The, NSF, the SBIR program is designed to build strong companies. And if you're outsourcing everything, then the company itself is not that strong. Technical and business assistance, you can request up to $65,000 for it with an NIH phase one. If you don't request the $65,000, you will be eligible for the default technical and business assistance and NIH gives you some just as part of getting the award. But if you want to use your own, you can request your own and you request it in this other category. Okay, uh, slides to review later. Samir said, yes, absolutely. Once we get done with the slides, we will post them. They will be available in Canvas. We've done that with the others and we will do that uh, this time as well. Budget justification. I won't go over the details here, but you will have to have a separate document that is a budget justification. The slides here contain some of the main points that you have to include. I'll just kind of skip through these because they, they maintain the information. Uh, Tabla you have to include in the budget justification. I also have a hypothetical budget here that shows you uh, what a budget will look like. You can look over the slides. I won't go over it right now but you can look and see what the budget looks like. This is what the budget actually looks like in ASSIST, in the online portal. What you actually do when you prepare the budget is prepare it in your own spreadsheet, some kind of an Excel spreadsheet. And so you make your own spreadsheet and then you jostle and just and play around with it in Excel until you get the numbers right. And then you hand enter all the numbers into ASSIST. And this is what example numbers look like in ASSIST. Now I have prepared a sample budget for you in Excel, and that will be available in Canvas. And so when you do the assignment, which I'm going to talk about right now, when you do this assignment, you can just take the example that I will have uploaded in the Canvas and you can erase the information that's there and include your own information. Or you can just create your own template in Excel if you want to, it's pretty easy to do. So the assignment is to draft a budget. You know, if you're uncertain about number of consultants or staff time or something like that, put in your best guess for now because the goal is for us to kind of look over the general flow and to answer your questions. Um, and prepare an outline of your budget justification. Go through the main points uh, that you intend to include in the budget. You don't have to write the text now, but this just gives you an idea of what you'll need to include. And lots of times this is where you start running into questions. You'll wonder this, you'll wonder that, you'll wonder what about this subcontract. And you can puzzle over that for a long time, but it's a lot better to get in touch with Chris or me and uh, just ask your question. Send us a quick email, schedule one of our office hours, and we'll answer the question. So rather than just spend your time puzzling and trying to figure out what's best, go ahead and get in touch with us. All right, that's my part. That concludes the budget discussion. I'll pause for any questions uh, and then we'll go on to letters of support.
but I'll pause now and see if there are any other questions. Does the budget outline differ much between NIH and NSF? No, actually the budgets tend to be very similar between those two, which is interesting because the text of the proposal is quite different. You've got 12 pages for uh, NSF or 15, you have 15 pages for NSF, you have only six for NIH, the format guidance are different, the structure is different. NIH has very little on commercial support, NIH has a lot on commercial support, quite different, but the budgets tend to be a lot alike. Any other questions? Uh, Roland, um, do you have any idea if we do the fast track uh, phase one and two, the finding, uh, because the finding budgets are very different, uh, are they the finding rates similar? Uh, you mean the uh, the award rates? Successful rates. The success yeah. rates. I, have you know, a very I don't have any opinion. really, yeah, really good data. That that information is kind of hard to come by. We know a success rate for phase one proposal. They tend to be around twelve to fifteen percent. I, I have a very strong opinion about direct to phase two and fast track, um, and and I would say that it would be extremely rare for a brand new company to win a fast track. And you're talking about you have to project three years out of technical development. That is very difficult for a new company. And it's very difficult for a new company in 2021 when technology moves at the speed of light. I see. All right, thank you. It, you, can, you can achieve almost the exact same thing. This is, I'll, uh, never mind, I'm gonna nerd out. But you could, you could achieve almost the exact same thing going the traditional route. It, 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 there's no reason to do a fast track. Okay, let's move, uh, move ahead. Mark, a quick question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yes, okay. Very quick. Are we allowed to send the same application to both NIH and SF? Yes, you are. That's, that's, a, that's a good question. That comes up a lot. You can send the same application to both institutions, but in your application, you have to tell them that you're doing that. And there's a place in the application to do that. There's a whole section on similar or overlapping proposals. And it's not uncommon to, to do that, um, even, even to turn to NSF to fund sort of the heavy tech nuts and bolts development of your technology, and then turn to NIH to fund sort of the patient focused, because those agencies are different in two different, or interested in two different sides of the development, where NSF is really interested in, interested in sort of, um, the way I always describe it is like what's inside the watch, like the gears and the nuts and the bolts that make it run, the, the engineering in here, where NIH would be interested in, and how does the watch improve patient outcomes? Well, patients get to, uh, their appointments on time, we can track their heart rate, you know, so they're, di they're interested in different things and you can apl apply to both of them for the same technology as long as they're doing different parts of the project. That can be an actual strategy. Uh, you, can, you, you have to think that through. If you have two related projects that are different enough that they might be funded by the different agencies, then you very carefully structure proposal so that they're discrete and different. And you say in your similar and uh, similar proposal section, you say, here's what we're proposing here. We've got similar work that we're proposing to NSF, but it's different and here's why. And so you might actually want to structure your work so that it's different enough to be fundable by two different institutions. Thanks, got it. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, Chris, you want to go ahead and uh, take over then? I'm going to talk about letters of support. Um, so first of all, letters of support are critically important. Now, they they have, they have if they're critically important in phase one, they are like direly important in phase two. So you have to have them in phase two. In phase one, they're critically important, um, but but they're not, you know, phase two, you, ha you have to have them. So get in the habit now of getting them, I guess, is the point. Don't wait till the last minute. This takes a long time to sort of cycle these letters through the required processes, um, depending on who you're getting them from. And I'll go over the buckets in just a second. Um, here are some sort of uh, key points about the letters as far as format. So they must be on a letterhead. And if you're working with a consultant who doesn't have their own letterhead, if they're just an independent consultant, just have them create one in Word. I mean, it takes 30 seconds to just type their name and address at the top like a letterhead. Um, and uh, the letter should be addressed to the company. And uh, if, they, if you want to address it to an individual, it would be to the principal investigator if that, or, the, or the contact at the company. 
Um, it should have a recent date. So sometimes people try to recycle letters from old proposals uh, that is not viewed very favorably by reviewers. Um, the uh, letter should, you should try to keep it to one page. Now this can be difficult because some, especially like large hospital institutions have these like insane letterheads where you can only get like three lines of text on a page, but do your best to keep it to one page. Um, and then you're gonna explain the roles and qualifications and I'll, I'll break down the paragraphs for you in just a second, um, but, but that needs to be in the letter. Uh, and there needs to be all of the contact information of the individual or institution on the letter. This will help you personally as you're filling out your forms with your for your um, key persons uh, uh, forms in your assist application, but also it's uh, sort of tells the agency if they ever wanted to reach out to this person, they could that, that there's no reason why they couldn't so phone number email all that kind of good information. Um, specifically mention the project by name, um, sometimes by title. Uh, that's usually the first thing we do is come up with a title for a project so you can request letters of support. And then it should include the rates or their fees. So um, Roland talked before about how subaward sites have their own separate package. Included in that package must be, if we're talking about NIH, um, a letter of intent to form a consortium. This is a very formal letter that comes from the university. It's not technically a letter of support. Uh, it has its own place that it goes on the forms, um, but, but that's required. Along with that, uh, a letter of an intent to form a consortium. I like to get a letter from the sub award PI um, just saying that they can't wait to serve in that role on the project, blah, 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 not required, um, but appreciated by reviewers. So here are sort of the letter buckets. Uh, on, the, on the far left, we start off with the administrative bucket. And that's what we just talked about. You have to have a letter. If you're gonna have a consultant, you have to have a letter from them that says their fees, what their role is, what, what they're gonna do on the project. Uh, you, you can get letters of support from advisors. So um, a lot of times for startup companies, one of the things that I love to recommend is to do like a medical advisory group. So they get, you know, like the 10 leading KOLs in their, their um, disease and put together a medical advisory group whose role will be to review the results of the phase one work or, you know, be on standby for questions. We get letters of support from those guys. Uh, if you have a fee for service, which um, Roland used a different word for it, and I can't remember what he called it um, on a previous si slide, but it's a, uh, you know, anytime you're purchasing like an assay or something where it's like um, 10, it's a, it's a price and quantity item. So 10 widgets for 10 bucks, that's a fee for service. You need a letter from, from them that lists the price and it should correspond to with what you put in your budget. Again, there's that intent to form a consortium and then the subaward PI letter if you can get it. The next bucket is potential customers or end users. And these letters come from people from the outside who say, I want to buy this. This is a product that I will use or my patients need this or this will make my, uh, my life in, in um, the clinic easier. This will allow me to spend more time with patients. This will allow us to have better data to make informed decisions. Whatever it is, this is from the potential end user or customer saying that they need it um, or they needed it at one point and it wasn't there. Uh, the best uh, end user letter I ever saw was um, we were working on a proposal for um, a rare childhood disease and the PI had a letter from a mother who had lost their child to that disease. And it was so heartfelt, every single reviewer commented on it. So that's, that's that bucket. The next bucket is potential investor. Now this is not required for phase one, repeat, 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 not required, but awesome to have, especially if your commercialization strategy may be licensing or acquisition, and you may already have that target in sight. Um, it's great to include, uh, include a letter from them. And it's not a commitment to buy, invest, or license. It simply says, the letter simply says, we're aware of this technology, it's interesting, and we're watching. That's all it has to say. It doesn't have to be a big commitment. Um, so for example, I have a client that is developing a um, tool for use in orthopedic surgery and has no interest in selling directly to the market. He wants to be acquired or licensed by one of the major orthopedic trauma suppliers. He has a letter from one of them saying, we've met, we've seen the technology, it's interesting. That's all it says. Uh, but that, that is a really important letter. 
really, really important for phase two, awesome to have for phase one. And then the next bucket of letters is key opinion leaders. And some reviewers really get kind of interested in, or look for these. And if they're not there, they'll say, oh, you don't have any input from key opinion leaders that it's needed. Oh. So um, these are great to have as well. So think about who's publishing in that area, who's the top leader in that field. Um, you know, I mean, literally go to PubMed and, and do a search and see who has, because that person also may be on the review panel or be friends with people on the review panel. Um, and so that all, all they're saying there is, again, they're an expert and they think that this has merit. You can also look at national organizations to do that. Um, for example, um, a client that works in Alzheimer's, he actually got a letter from a regional uh, Alzheimer's Association and uh, one reviewer was like, oh, that, that's not very impressive. He should have gotten it from national. Well, you know, that's really much harder to do than it sounds. Um, like AARP will not write letters of support. So it is very difficult to get those kinds of letters, but if you can, that's great. Okay, so here's a sort of sample out, uh, outline of text that I like to use in these letters of support. You will be writing these letters of support for these people. You will be preparing a template. Um, so don't just ask for a letter of support, send a template uh, that sort of follows this format and allows them to sort of fill in the blanks. Um, they might change it, that's fine, but everybody responds better to something that they have to edit instead of a blank piece of paper. So this just sort of um, gives you the general format. It's pretty much the same for all the different letters. Um, it just sort of paragraph three and four kind of um, vary slightly. Okay, Roland, that's it. That's all I had on letters. Do you want to add anything about letters? Uh, just that uh, if you can show a commitment from the letter writer, that's very strong. What you want to do is to avoid the appearance of applause from the sidelines. Oh, you know, you're a great uh, researcher and we really like your effort and we hope it gets funded. That's just kind of general applause from the sidelines. Yes. What you yes. want is an investor or a, a, a purchaser to say, we really need this project. We want it so much, we're willing to invest some of our resources to help it out. Or from an investor, we really love this technology. It's a little risky for us right now, but we're ready to invest if it can work. So you want to show some level of commitment. That's really the key. And that takes some negotiation. That's something you can't just fill out a template and hand it off to someone and hope that they sign. You have to talk to them ahead of time understand what they're willing to do, kind of go back and forth about what you're willing to do. And then, um, you know, then draft that into text that they sign themselves or send up to their bureaucracy to sign. But there's a negotiation and a back and forth to, to extract from them what they're willing to commit to. But that's really what you want. So exactly. And that's why you have to start early because that can yeah. take forever. I mean, if you're, if you're trying to get a letter of support from Medtronic, you're talking two months, you know, so... Yeah. Start early, and I think that another good point to that, Roland, is these are not letters of personal uh, of endorsement to you as a person or to the company. So, um, no letter from your banker or you know from your previous employer that you're a good guy. That's not what what these are. These are endorsing the technology, um, or not really even endorsing, uh, providing support for the technology. Yeah. All right, we're at the end of our time today, um, and so if you need to leave, that's perfectly fine. Chris, I think the assignments are self-explanatory. We don't okay. need to go through them, but you said you were willing to talk about structure a little bit. So we'll go ahead, if, if that's okay with the, the hosts, let's go ahead and say that anybody who wants to stick around and learn more about the program structure, great, Chris is willing to talk about that. If you have any questions on the assignments, make sure and let us know. If you need to leave, great, You know, thank you for your attention and we'll be in touch and look forward to your next round of exercises. So uh, that's the official session end, but for those who want to stick around and learn about program structure, Chris is ready to talk. Yeah, and this is just a nerdy thing too. So this isn't going to, um, I just think it's helpful to have an understanding of how things, um, the, how things are organized. I'm a visual person. And so I like to see things visually. Um, I noticed on some of the, um, uh, oh wait, I noticed on some of the program, uh, the emails to the program officers, maybe some of that structure isn't clear. So I just wanna run through that very, very quickly. So overall, 
Um, the, the SBIR program is, uh, comes from legislation in Congress and goes down to the SBA. And the SBA administers the program through a program directive. And then there are these green boxes. There are a total of 11 federal agencies that participate. So um, when we're talking about you know, NSF or other agencies, those are just one of 11. Agencies are either in or out, depending on their extramural research budget. Um, I've been doing this for 20 years. It's the same 11 as it was 20 years ago. They've changed in size. Some are big now, some are small, but it's the same 11. And then the red, bo the uh, blue boxes are um, then uh, the next level. And then some agencies, which we'll see, have even further letter levels. So again, SBA sets the highest order of rules. I know all of these, like um, these, well, you'll see my next example. You're going to know that I have my degree and my degree is actually in public affairs. So I'm really interested in how governments and cities work. And you'll, <laughs> hence the map example. And so the SBA starts, sets the highest order of rules. Agencies set their own order of rules, which must be equal to or greater than SBIR or SBAs. Components set their own rules, which must be greater than or equal to the SBAs and the agencies. And then for NIH, individual institutes and centers set their own rules, which must be equal to or greater than SBAs, agencies, and components. So you can see how this trickles down. We're talking about a lot of federal bureaucracy here. So with the first level is the federal level. If we're talking about, I use the um, sort of structure of our, of our government to help you help people understand how this works. The federal level is the SBA. And then if you look and think, sort of think about like, oh, okay, at a state level, that would be the 11 agencies. And then, um, oh, that should say city level, I'm sorry. City level, you're talking about individual agencies within that. So when we say NIH, NIH is actually within the, the Department of Health and Human Services, which also includes CDC, FDA, ACL, uh, and a couple of other smaller, smaller components. So this is a really deep bench. And then when we look at individual institutes and centers within NIH, those are sort of like your town or neighborhood level, which also means there's a ton of sort of ebb and flow and flexibility there. Um, like Roland said, we were laughing earlier about how many of the rules vary from program officer to program officer or whoever's processing your grant award. I mean, there really is nothing certain at that level because it's, it's enacted by humans. Okay, so then within NIH, if we're looking at within NIH, there's 24 institutes and centers those larger, every institute or center across the agency has a director or a chief of that, that particular, and those are organized by disease state, um, which is not how uh, um, review panels are organized, by the way. Um, so the larger ICs uh, or institutes or centers typically have a specific person set aside to address small business concerns. It's a, their whole focus is uh, so take cancer, NCI, they have a huge infrastructure internally to support small businesses who are developing technology for, um, for that disease state. They typically have a commercialization focused person who kind of helps like, you know, with the bridge funding and access to other, um, like the CAP program to help furtherize, further your technology commercialization after phase two. Uh, they typically have analysts who are available to sort of, uh, you know, they analyze all the data that comes in from the research studies. But then there are smaller institutes and centers and they typically rely on general staff to also oversee SBIR, STTR. And that's sort of why I mentioned earlier, like be wary of sort of those um, blanket cut and paste emails from some program officers because they are totally overloaded and SBIR, or STTR is just a small portion of their portfolio. So, you know, they get an email about SBIR, SCTR, they're like, oh yeah, cut, cut, paste, send, and it might not really apply to you. So don't, don't try to take all that stuff super personally. And then at that level, the program officers, um, some focus on 100% SBIR, again, with those larger institutes or centers, um, but then again, some have those other funding mechanisms. Now, within NIH, when you're looking at a particular solicitation or a topic within an institute or center, you're going to see three people listed, okay? Now, sometimes on a topic, if you're looking at the big 240 pages of topics for the 24 institutes or centers, 
you'll see scientific research contacts for various things, like it might say for um, HIV AIDS, for in vitro, for animal studies, for you know whatever, they'll break it out and have different contacts, but sometimes there's only one contact depending on how big or small the agency is. The scientific slash research contact is the person you want to contact about applying to the program. The peer review contact is the person who will organize the review of your proposal. They will reach out to you when your proposal is about to be reviewed, but you really don't have a lot of contact with this person. And then the financial and grants management contact is the person that will contact you if your proposal is getting awarded. Sometimes bigger agencies have one person for the pre-award process and then you switch over to a grants management person in the post-award process. It just depends on the agency. But I wanted to point out that the scientific research coordinator is the person that you, or scientific research contact is the person that you want to um, contact about your proposal. That's all I got. I mean, I could talk for hours. If anybody just ever wants to like talk about SBIR, I, you guys know how it is. You, nobody knows what this is. So you don't ever get to talk about it with anybody, right? You don't go to a dinner party and are like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. you see that budget? <laughs> oh. <laughs> all right, any, any other questions or any other comments from the hosts? No, thank you. Not for this, but I wonder if uh, next week assignments, if we have a couple of minutes to talk at the end for next week assignments will be uh, great. Like, I know usually that you, I always delay in my assignment, like, oh, the last day I feel, oh, there are five, <laughs> but this may be a little bit uh, structure to cover at the end of this lecture for next week assignments, for example. Okay, you'll notice we, we, we kind of skip through them, but you do have slides with the assignments in them. Oh, the, the beginning, I'm sorry, I missed the first slide then. Yeah, yeah, so there are slides with that information in them. So once I get the slides uploaded, you'll see that. Oh, uh, okay. And and the exercises will be uploaded like sometime this afternoon. Oh, oh, okay, all right, thanks. I tried to get them up just before the session begins, but I wasn't able to do that this week. But yeah, we yeah, what you say is good guidance. You know, We will try and include a, a discussion of them in the presentation. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, well, have a great day, everybody. We'll uh, look forward to your assignments. Have a good week.